Okay, so um, this is the second talk on this. Uh, and I, I'm going to overlap with the first talk a bit, and then we'll continue on. So, so I'm uh, I'm looking at uh, a very simplified version of a discrete process and its observation. Uh, I have an X, which could be a, a scalar or it could be a non-commuting variable or it could you could imagine it being some complex of information, which is evolving in time. First there's X, then there's X prime. And at any given point, there's there might be X prime and then there's X double prime. So rather than using a subscript, which I might use sometime, X prime just means the next time. And we'll assume that there's enough structure so that one can talk about the difference between X prime and X. And then uh, one could call that the velocity. Uh, it would later perhaps be divided by a delta T. And then uh, I want to think about successive measurements. And as I say, this is a highly simplified model. So the only time that I have a clock ticking is when I measure the velocity. Otherwise, um, I don't worry about how much time things took. So if I have Vx, then that means first measure x and then measure V. But in order to measure V, I need to let the clock tick in order to get the difference. And so if after measuring V, I then measured x again, it would be x prime. And on the other hand, if I measure V first and then I measure x, uh, then the x that gets measured is x prime. So that's illustrated near the bottom of the slide. Vx, as a in terms of measurement, becomes x prime minus x multiplied by x. But xv becomes x prime multiplied by x prime minus x because the x on the left is happening one tick later than the x on the right. And so you have a commutator that's non-trivial you have xv minus vx, and as you see from the algebra there, um, you have x prime minus x squared. Assuming that the x's and the x primes are commuting here so that we could do the algebra in the usual way. And then I introduce an operator that keeps track of the time shifting so that uh, I wouldn't have to keep thinking what was left and what was right of another thing, uh, uh, even if I had already evaluated it. So putting the operator in, I write V is equal to J times X prime minus X. And that means even if you had evaluated X prime minus X, there's still the tick of the clock. And if you're to the left of the J uh, and you... Uh, and you are evaluating, then uh, the J doesn't uh, act on you as long as you leave it. Leave the J to the left. But if you're to the right of the J, uh, why then you, if you move the J past it, the tick occurs. So this does automatically what we were doing by keeping track. And uh, I've indicated how that works here. I have X V minus V X. And, the, and then it becomes articulated as xj times x prime minus x minus j times x prime minus x times x. And now we don't have to think about it. We just use the algebra. Shifting j's all the way to the left does all the time shifting needed. And we get j times x prime minus x squared as before. So this is telling us that we can keep track of discrete derivatives by putting in a time shifting operator in this way. Um, and I could think of doing this in the calculus where I have delta t's involved in the same way. X on the left, j on the left of an x, you push the x over onto the left of it, and it shifts x up by one delta t. And I can have a discrete derivative, which I'm calling d, by taking j and multiplying it by the usual difference quotient. But then you will notice that j x j times t x at t plus dt minus j times x of t, j times the difference, 
is the same as x of t times j minus j times x of t. It's a commutator with x. So that the difference that we have described is in fact a commutator. And that makes it work formally in the calc, its calculus works formally like ordinary calculus. The Leibniz rule will be satisfied, by which I mean that if you take the derivative of a product, it will be the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And when we compute the commutator, uh, or compute the derivative, either way, you get j times delta x squared, that was the x prime minus x, divided by delta t. You still have just one delta t, but you have delta x squared. And that is interesting in its own right, and I thought I would slow down on this point a little bit. Um, it's interesting in its own right because it says that if you were to set x delta x, uh, x dx equal to a constant, then you're setting delta x squared over delta t equal to a constant. And then you can imagine processes that have very tiny delta x and tiny delta t, and you're trying to understand the limit of such processes where you hold delta x squared over delta t constant. And this situation is well known. Um, it is the situation of a diffusion equation. And I thought I would remind you of that because it's interesting to see how this matter of delta x squared over delta t is coming up here, uh, not by trying to get a limit to happen, but simply by looking at the structure of a process. Now, you will notice that if we set it equal to a constant, this is down near the bottom of the slide. If you set delta x squared over delta t equal to a constant, then that means that delta x squared is k delta t, so that delta x, the change in x at any given time, is square root of k delta t, or minus the square root of k delta t. So that, uh, that process is a Brownian process. You have a constant, that square root of k delta t, and you step either adding it or subtracting it, um, randomly, let's say, or by some rule that you don't know. Um, and that's your process. And that process satisfies the commutator that of x with velocity is equal to a constant. I think the next slide repeats this, uh, saying it in the previous notation. That's all. But the, the thing is that, as I said, you have this process where you're stepping to the right or to the left randomly, let's say, where in other words, you don't know the rule. Uh, but nevertheless, you still get the commutator is equal to a constant. And the constant is up to the j, the square of the step length divided by the time. Uh, and I thought I would remind you where that, how that usually comes up, because it's interesting to compare these two different points of view. It, it usually comes up without thinking about non-commutative algebra by saying, well, we have a process where x at t plus the change in time, tau, is x of t plus or minus delta for some, some absolute value delta, some constant. And then we're interested in the probability of being at a given location x at time t plus tau, or at any given time t. But this, this tells you if this is 50-50, and let's uh, imagine that it's a 50-50 chance of going to the left or to the right, then the probability of being at x minus delta uh, and coming up is one way to get to uh, x. And you could be at x plus delta and come back down. And uh, it's 50-50, so the probability of being at x minus delta over 2 plus the probability of being at x plus delta over 2 adds up to the probability of being at x. Now you get a recursive equation there for the probability. And, and then you look at that and try to turn it into a differential equation. And in order to do that, you, you take a difference quotient for time p at time at t plus tau minus probability at time t, divide by tau, 
and you see uh, that um, that you will you will get an expression in the probability of x at x minus delta, the probability at x plus delta, and the probability of sitting at x over there on the right for a given time. So the time over on the right is t, and the time over on the left involves t plus tau. And this is uh, uh, the discretization of a differential equation where on the left you have taken the time derivative with respect to tau, partial, and on the right you have taken the uh, second derivative with respect to space. And you get, uh, I see there's a misprint here, uh, you see that in the slot in the calculation, I divided by delta squared in order to rationalize a second order quotient. And the h over there in the equation should have been a delta. So you see we get delta squared over two tau times the second derivative with respect to space. And so you can then say, all right, um, I could take a limit and get a differential equation if it were the case that delta squared over 2 tau was constant. So I imagine processes where the step length squared divided by the change in time remains the same, even though they get very small. Uh, and then I go to a diffusion equation. I get that the derivative of p with respect to t is that constant times the second derivative with respect to x squared. And that's the diffusion equation. So what we've seen is that the constant for the diffusion equation comes up here as the constant that you get when you ask the commutator to be constant. And uh, I think that, require, re, that suggests that we should look at this more carefully. And I have looked at it off and on, but I think it still requires more thought. Uh, and maybe I can come back to this sometime and talk about it further. But in any case, I think you see that it's um, remarkable that you get uh, the situation of diffusion coming from just thinking about a very elementary process. And here you get the description that leads you to the differential equation if you have that situation. Uh, let's look at another aspect of this discretization. If I were to take the uh, the time operator to be of the f following form, one minus i over h bar times h delta t, where h is something, uh, which you could put in for your own taste. Uh, I take a j that has this property, and I define nabla c, nabla psi, to be the commutator of psi with j over delta t. So that's my derivative. And now um, you calculate nabla psi using this time step, okay? And this time step looks like the approximation to e to the minus i over h bar h delta uh, t right? Uh, uh, a well-known kind of time evolution operator. Well, in this discrete form, you do the commutator, and I've written it out. And writing it out, you now see that there's a part that's commutative, because we're assuming that psi is, um, uh, I'm sorry, no, never mind. I mean, psi could be non-commutative. But the point is that when you write it out, you see you get a psi times one, delta t commutes with everybody, and those parts cancel, and you're left only with the commutator of psi with h, minus i over h bar psi with h. And this is uh, exactly the Heisenberg form of the Schrodinger equation. So uh, you see how um, by working discreetly in the sense of commutator derivatives, you can sometimes land quite precisely on what you knew about before uh, for quantum mechanics. And that's what happens here. The H could be the Hamiltonian. Um,
You can also look directly for the Heisenberg commutator in the sense of P and Q, and we talked about this last time, so I'll skip it. And uh, this is reviewing it again, so I'll skip that. And then I remind you that uh, what I want to do is think more generally about that whole situation. So I'm going to just consider uh, the mathematics for a while of derivatives represented by commutators. Uh, and then indeed you have that if you if you call novel sub n of f the commutator of f with n, then you have uh, that it satisfies the Leibniz rule and you have this uh, uh, paradise uh, of formal calculus where you can play around with what are the consequences of doing derivatives with commutators. And then we talked about that and we talked about how the Jacobi identity uh, gives rise to thinking about curvature as commutator and and uh, and we talked about directional derivatives and curvature and the Bianchi identity, and I won't go over that again. And uh, then we talked about setting up a non-commutative world, and a, and a non-commutative world is then set up in the following way, in this form, that I have some commuting coordinates, this is my flat world, and, um, and I have partial derivatives with respect to those commuting coordinates, represented by other quantities that don't commute with the axis, but they delta ij them so that the partial derivative of xi with respect to xj is delta ij. And then I have dif as the partial of f with respect to xi, which is a commutator with pi. And I have the dual, the partial of f with respect to pi, which will be the commutator of xi with f. And, um, and then with respect to those, um, I can add time into the brew by having a fake Hamiltonian or an unknown Hamiltonian, which commute, which whose commutator with f is the derivative with respect to time of f, um, and then the formalism itself produces Hamilton's equations. Let's look at that again, just for the heck of it. Um, you take dPi dt, and that, of course, is its commutator with the h, but that's minus the commutator of h with pi, but pi is a certain, doing that is a certain derivative, and it is the derivative with respect to xi, with a minus sign. And you take the partial, yeah, excuse me, you take the time derivative of xi with respect to t, and that is the commutator with h, and that's the partial of h with respect to pi by our duality. So, by taking the definition of the non-commutative world in that way, Hamilton's equations of motion are part of the mathematics. And what becomes physics is the choice of the Hamiltonian. Uh, I won't recall again Hamilton's equations in classical mechanics, but I will recall again uh, what a general equation of motion looks like in a non-commutative world in this sense. You have the xi's and they're evolving and uh, their evolution is given by some g's and those g's are some elements in the algebra, um, in the not big non-commutative algebra. And if I write the g's relative to the p's, which were the simple ones, the ones that represented commuting derivatives, then you see that the g's represent covariant derivatives in the sense that the derivatives that they represent will not commute with one another, that there is a curvature for them. And that if you ask what kind of derivatives do those g's represent, what kind of curvature do they produce in the sense of commutators, you compute the commutator of the gi with the gj, and it's a familiar calculation. It gives you di aj minus dj ai plus the commutator of ai aj, the formal counterpart of the curvature of a gauge field, gauge connection. So um, a lot of things uh, cohere in the formalism of the non-commutative world. Things become mathematical tautologies that are 
well understood as being correspondent to certain aspects of physics. Uh, I wanted to go on with that a little bit before going over to the Feynman Dyson derivation. Uh, I wanted to show you how you can think of a metric in this form. Um, and uh, one natural way to think of a metric is to have some elements that commute with the x's, so they look like scalars. That doesn't mean they commute with everyone, of course, and they should be symmetric. And then you will find that if you then define the h uh, as a quadratic Hamiltonian in the non-commutative way, the usual quadratic Hamiltonian would be one half g i j p i p j. If you're thinking of p i and p j as like momenta, uh, then I've just uh, made a symmetrized version for non-commutative algebra here with that h, and you can calculate that um, that uh, the commutator of x i with x j dot is g i j. So that the metric is emerging as the way in which the velocity x j dot is non-commuting with the position. And then one can go on and look at the kind of geometry of this situation. So I won't um I the slides will come to you anyway, and you don't want to be dragged through the computation. But it is amusing to watch how this works when you do it. You find that you do the commutators and apply the Jacobi identity and things simplify. And you're getting used to doing calculus in this way when you do that. Um, so in fact, you find uh, that the Hamiltonian h, which is giving you the time derivative of the f, um, uh, obeys a constraint which is what you would expect it to obey, namely that the derivative in, with respect to time of the f is given by the sum of the time derivatives of its variables multiplied by the partial derivatives of the f with respect to those variables. Notice that's what I've written. Bracket f p i is the de partial derivative of f with respect to x i. So this is a familiar ordinary calculus formula. But it isn't obvious in the non-commutative world. It won't even be true in general. It is true when the, the Hamiltonian is quadratic. And if you turn that around, you can say, well, I would like this kind of constraint to be true in my non-commutative world. I hope it reflects physics in a way that's close to the way I usually think of calculus. In that case, you find that you're going to need a quadratic Hamiltonian. So if you think that having a quadratic Hamiltonian is part of the physics, you might think again and understand that it is in its way a consequence of asking for this constraint between the non-commutative world and the world of commuting and limitable or calculus that can be made into limits. So this this then begins to lead off into uh, a speculation that can be experimented with mathematically, that somehow asking for constraints that would be satisfied of a very ordinary kind, saying that calculus advanced calculus equations that you like about variations of things should be still true in the non-commutative world, you find that you're constraining things in the direction of having more physics. And we would like to understand what that means, or at least see what the consequences are. You've seen one of the consequences here, the quadratic Hamiltonian. So this is a summary of what I said so far. Um, and the xi xj dot equal gij is a generalization of the Feynman Dyson case where they got electromagnetism with a delta ij for the xi xj dot. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, I have more to say about the way the metric behaves, and I think I'll tell you just a little. Um,
This is one of them. Do you remember the DI hat? The DI hat was the derivative with respect to PI, and it was the commutator of XI with whatever it is, dually to the way the XI behaves, derivatives behave. Here I have written the an expression uh, commuting, computing something about the GJKs which you may dredge out of your memory or see for the first time. It's a curious expression. It is a, a, the derivative with respect to i of gjk plus the derivative with respect to j of gik minus the derivative with respect to k of gij. That is called the levi civita connection in its incarnation in differential geometry. Um, and what I'm computing here is that it comes out by taking the p derivatives twice of the acceleration of the point xk so that the uh levi civita connection is coming out as a coefficient of the acceleration term for a particle moving that you get it at all uh, comes just from commutators. Um, now, I haven't perhaps reminded you sufficiently what I meant by uh, delta i. Um, delta i is the commutator with xi dot. So remember that I said partial with three, I had partials before. And those partials were with respect to the PIs. But I'm going to take uh, a certain covariant derivative delta I with respect to the XI dot. Um, it's the right thing to do. And I'm only giving you a sketch here, so I'm not going to justify everything. But what you see here is the sort of remarkable thing that happens in this algebra. Once you've understood that that's what you meant by delta I, then this equation that I wrote is just the Jacobi identity happening in the right order of things. Just look at it for that. Just take, take it as a formalism. Um, you see, I'm looking in the line of calculation, and I'm going to take the I derivative of the J derivative of the XK double dot. And that means I take a commutator with XI of the commutator with respect to XJ of XK double dot. and then. Um, and then I, I use the fact that I can uh, rewrite that in terms of the G's and, and continue walking along, getting more commutators. And then sometimes I get a commutator in, in, an, in a certain order, uh, and I can replace it by two others by using the Jacobi identity. That's all I have to work with. I use the Jacobi identity, rewrite, and and then reinterpret these commutators as various kinds of derivatives and out comes the Levi-Civita connection. Not the way you usually think of the Levi-Civita connection as appearing. And so here, certain aspects of geometry in the sense of differential geometry are appearing out of the algebra and the way the algebra uh, can be used to measure how things are moving about. Um, the general result that you get here is that the acceleration term is given by a certain scalar field, another field which uh, is acting on velocity, which is the analog of a gauge field, and those connection terms acting on the products of velocities. So it says it's the analog of up to some perturbations given by the gauge field moving in a geodesic uh, according to that connection. And so this also has its relatives in the usual interpretations of the way particles move under constraints in ordinary uh, analysis of particle motion. And here um, it's appearing in the non-commutative calculus of commutators in these ways. So this can be 
um, thought of as an, another way to get at the differential geometry of motion and needs to be looked at further. Um, all of this needs to be looked at further. And now I'm going to take a deep breath and go back to the generalized Feynman-Dyson derivation. So in a way, we start just from scratch in that I'm not using the levi vita connection and I'm not using anything except the ideas that we had before. And I'm back in three dimensions of space variables, x1 through x3. And I'm going to and I'm going to have x dot, as we had it before, commutator with some h. And I'm going to define fields b and e by x dot cross x dot is b. That looks paradoxical, but since the coefficients don't necessarily commute, <coughs> excuse me, commute, that is the xi's and the xi dots do not commute. This will, and the xi dots certainly are not given to commute with one another. Um, the b is measuring how the xi dots don't commute, as you see. And the e is the, is the partial derivative with respect to time of x dot. And now we'll see that we're going to get into a constraint discussion about what's meant by partial derivative with respect to time of the x dot. I'm using non-commutative vector cross product, which is just the usual definition of the vector cross product where I keep track of the order. So I have A cross B, and I have the A variables first and the B variables second. And if you were to switch them around, writing B and A, uh, they don't necessarily commute. And I have a covariant derivative here. This is... Uh, actually more general than electromagnetism. Uh, what we're looking at here is as general as the previous discussion that was giving us gauge fields when we looked at it the way we looked at it. We have a covariant derivative with of f, which is the commutator of f with xi dot. And then I'm going to define the partial derivative with respect to time of f to be equal to f dot minus the sum on i of xi dot di of f. So this is the usual calculus formula that f dot is equal to the sum on i of xi dot di of f plus the partial with respect to time of f, the usual splitting up. But it's expressed as in terms of these new derivatives, which are not commuting with one another. And that's my definition of dt of f. That's a constraint, uh, but it's not uh, as simple a constraint as the one I said before, because of the fact that these derivatives are not the ones in the commuting non-commutative world, the flat one. These are these covariant derivatives that have to do with the xi dots. And it is with respect to them that I define dt of f. So the derivation then is a theorem about dt of f, if you like, with this definition of it in this context. The theorem is this, that if you define b the way we defined it, you define e the way we defined it, then you will prove that x double dot is e plus x dot cross b. So this is like my formula before about x double dot, only now it's assuming the form of the usual form of acceleration for electromagnetism, splitting into E and B across product of velocity with B. And you will find that the divergence of B is zero, that, um, that partial with respect to T of B is minus del cross E plus a non-commuting term b cross b and the partial with respect to t of e is equal to del cross b plus another term so that's what we're about to do we're going to prove these things so
we're proving all of the all of these analog equations that look like electromagnetism but are in fact more general than electromagnetism actually expressing some kind of gauge theory but still more general than that living in a non-commutative situation from nothing other than the definition of the partial with respect to t as being this difference or tension between the time derivative of f and its expression in terms of the time derivatives of its coordinates. In order to prove it, I use a, a, a diagrammatic formalism involving the epsilon. The epsilon is a, a well-known little tensor involving three indices, and I write it diagrammatically as a trivalent vertex, as in the bottom of this slide, epsilon ABC. And it is the sign of the permutation ABC. So if you add one, two, and three on the bottom, it would be one. If you add two, one, and three on the bottom, it'd be minus one. If you had one, one, and three on the bottom, it'd be zero because it gives you zero if ABC has a repetition. And there is a beautiful identity about the epsilon, which actually gives rise to all sorts of things. Um, and this identity is indicated up at the top of the slide. So we're slowing down and looking at this identity. Uh, the identity says that if you take uh, two epsilons and tie them together along a line, and when you tie them together along a line, you mean that you sum over all the indices that are available along that line. For example, if you had one and two at the top and one and two at the bottom, the only index available would be three because epsilons vanish otherwise. So it's no big sum. And the identity says that that will be equal to the negative of a Kronecker delta running between A and D multiplied by a Kronecker delta running between B and C plus a chron the product of a Kronecker delta running from A to C and a Kronecker delta running from B to D. Kronecker deltas are equal to one when the two indices are equal and zero otherwise. And are indicated by little line segments with the indices at their ends. So that says that the, the um, plugging the two epsilons into one another can be resolved into two parallel lines minus uh, two parallel lines with a negative sign plus cross lines with a positive sign. Um, you can do it in your head and see that it's true. Suppose that A and B are one and two and that D and C are one and two. So you have ones on the left and twos on the right. Then you have one, two, three on the top, and you have three, you have to start doing it cyclically, you have two, one, three on the bottom. One, three, two on the bottom, two, one, three. Two, one, three is minus, one, two, three is plus. So the entire evaluation on the left of ones on the left, two, three, twos, on, twos on the right, and a three in the middle is minus one. But ones on the left means that the A equals the D and the B equals the C, and you get a minus one from that parallel line. And the other way around is zero, A being one and C being two, uh, that's zero. So you see, you get a minus one under those circumstances. If you were to switch the bottom indices from one and two to two and one, why then you get one and one, you get one, two, three, and you also get one, two, three on the bottom. And uh, the, the parallel lines on the left switch out because you're trying to get one equal to two, which it ain't. And the, para and the cross lines switch in because a does equal C, you have A equal one and C equals one, B equals two and D equals two. So you see it's a switching identity uh, and it's true. I said I'm digressing for a little while to get used to the epsilons. Um, now I can do vector calculus or even non-commutative vector calculus using lines and connections. A vector might have an index. The index is indicated by a little line sticking down from the blob that is the vector. If I wish to take the scalar product a dot b, I write a with its line connected to b. 
That's the same as writing A sub I, B sub I, same index. And it means the same thing. You sum over I, A sub I, B sub I. That's a scalar product. The line, if it has no free ends, is to be summed over all its possible indices, as I said. So here's our epsilon identity, which you can think of without indices, right? Whenever you see two tied epsilons, you are allowed to replace them by um, smoothing them into two parallel arcs or two crossed arcs with an appropriate sign. You can also keep track of how epsilons change sign if lines cross. If you put a little twist between two lines near the epsilon, it interchanges the indices and causes it to change sign. And the cross product? Well, the cross product is exactly sticking an epsilon into the indices of A and B, just as I've indicated there. A little y below A and B is the cross product of A with B. More exercises before we go into the derivation. A little, um, a little vector calculus for you. A cross B dot C. There it is, a y under A and tied up into C, but you can push that diagram topologically and you get a Y under B, C, and so that's equal to A dot B cross C. A cross B dot C cross D, there it is. But you see, now we have a, a double Y and we can parallel or cross those lines and replace by a sum. And then you see what we have. We have, in the first case, minus a dot d times b dot c. And in the second case, we have a dot c times b dot d. Assuming that the scalars commute here, that's the determinant of a dot c, a dot d, b dot c, b dot d, a very well-known formula for the dot product of two cross products. And last but not least, look at the triple cross product, a cross b cross c. Well, there again, you get a double Y, and you can split that edge into parallel and crossed, and then look at what you got, and you see you get minus A, still a vector, times B dot C, plus A dot C times B. Um, and I won't bother you with the last line. So you can also have operators in here. You might want to work with the curl, and you would have an operator instead of an A. And everything can be worked out for advanced calculus, for vector calculus, or non-commutative vector calculus, as we're about to do, by using the diagrams uh, for the epsilon. So here's our setup. A dot B is A connected to B with the line. A cross B has a, an epsilon tied into AB. The J partial, covariant partial of F, is F commutator XJ dot by definition. And now what about F dot, FJ dot, you might say? Well, um, this, is, this is an expression of my constraint condition. Remember, that's a definition of DT, that F dot is DTF plus um, xi dot the partial. I think I'm missing a dot in that formula. Yep. There should be a dot on the x in that. And I didn't write it in this case. Okay. So you have to, in your imagination, put a dot on that x because, after all, that's what we wanted. We wanted the xi dot summed against the partial of f with respect to xi. OK, misprint. Uh, and the curl of f. Well, the curl of f is the cross product with the partial. And that turns out to be minus f x dot, because that's what happened there. So. Let's begin. Here's my formula for F dot at the top of the slide without the misprint, it's written correctly. But you might want to slow down and convince yourself again that this is right. 
You see, what I've written on the right-hand side is the partial with respect to T of F, no problem. And there might be some indices, and that's what the lines are about. And then I have, if I call the index I, then I have Xi dot summed on I with F commutator Xi dot. F commutator Xi dot is the ith partial with respect to I of F in our covariant form, delta I of F, knob I of F. So this is the advanced calculus formula. So now I've just simply written it out as a commutator. We have x dot, and then we have f, and then we have x dot. And I'm keeping track of where the indices are the same by the lines. And I have x dot, x dot, x dot, f, after exchanging the order of f and x dot. And now I'm going to put in for f x itself, x dot itself. If I put in for f x dot, then on the left-hand side, I get x double dot. On the right-hand side, I get dt of x dot. And then the f becomes an x dot. And so everybody's an x dot now. And now you're looking at that with second two terms. And you see that one of them is a, is a parallel lines and the other is a cross line and you can put it back together as a triple vector cross product of x dot with itself just go from the last line back up by expanding the edge and you end up in the previous line and now you look at that last line and read it out and it says dt of x dot plus x dot crossed with x dot cross x dot. And so there it is. There's the formula. There's the Lorentz formula. And if we, we had taken dt of x dot to be the e, and we had taken the x dot cross x dot to be the b. And so there they are. And that's the proof of the first part. So E is dt x dot, B is x dot cross x dot. And then we have x dot is equal to E plus x dot cross B. Now what about the divergence of B? The divergence of B is the sum of uh, delta I of B over I. And that is the sum of the commutators of B with x dot, x I dot. So it's that little diagram. And written as a commutator, that's B uh, with a line connecting it to X dot minus X dot with a line connecting it to B. And remember what B is? B is X dot cross X dot. So I put it in. And it gives me zero. Because it doesn't matter what you do to that little Y you can push it around. And that's the divergence of B is equal to zero in this theory. Now I need to look at B dot. I want to look at DT of B. And DT of B is by our constraint formula, B dot plus x dot tied into x dot commutator b. And I'm going to compute it. So I have b dot is remember b is x dot cross x dot and that's what's written there and now i have taken the dot of that 
And the one half, well, you can check that. Uh, it, it's correct. The one half is correct if you do your arithmetic. And, and then when you apply the derivative, uh, you, you will get two terms, one uh, on the x dot and the other on the other one, and the one half disappears, and you get x double dot commutator x dot tied into an epsilon. But x double dot, we already worked out what x double dot is. It's e plus x dot cross b, so I put it in. And, and then you see that I get minus del cross e. That's what the first term is. And the second term um, is just ex re-expressed in terms of the cross product there. So I got that far. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Well, this is repeating where I was before, that uh, B dot, and B dot can be expressed in terms of DTB. So, so B dot is DTB plus del cross E, um, and that's equal to what we worked out before. Sorry, this is a little hard to follow on a slide, but I'll walk through it. Um, for the sake of that, um, and and you see at the at the end of the previous calculation, we uh, we had an edge which should be expanded. So we get that edge and we expand it, um, and collect the terms. And lo and behold, after you collect the terms, you get b cross b. So so. This one would bear your attention, but there's probably no point in trying to say its details. You do the calculation this way, and you get the DTB plus del cross E is B cross B. And um, if you were thinking of looking at the limiting situation where, uh, where this might approach a theory that was smooth rather than discrete, the B cross B would be uh, a term that would disappear. You would expect it to disappear. Um, now I'm uh, working on uh, on E and del cross B. So if I have E is dt of x dot, then I have dt of e is, of course, just dt squared of x dot, and we'll keep that in mind. And what about the curl of b? Well, here's the curl of b. You have a, a the, the d operator and the x dot cross x dot. Uh, and we expand that by the edge, and we get the d operator on the x dot and the d operator on the x dot, but there's a commutator, and we put it back together um, and see that, in fact, we have a commutator. Um, and then... You see that that is the same as the dot product of d with d because you're uh, you're having d operating on d uh, itself, but summed over over the i of the index of it, and so you get del squared x dot, and so you get that dt of e minus del cross b is dt squared minus del squared times x dot, and that's the last version of Maxwell equation. And we have proved uh, modulo uh, the fact that uh, it's too fast, uh, this theorem, which is showing how the form of electromagnetism in a generalized gauge theoretic kind of form comes out of nothing other than the definition of dt in this context. So, my assertion is that this uh, needs more thought. It needs more thought in relation to forms of electromagnetism generalized that describe gauge theory. It needs more thought in terms of what happens when you take the limit of a discrete model of this kind and look at how it actually impinges on, on the physical theories the way we normally think about them. It needs more thought philosophically in the sense that we're getting 
an awful lot of formalism that we usually think of as physics coming out of nothing but the mathematics. And I do not assert that physics is just mathematics. Uh, the question is, uh, what what is the distinction uh, that really is about percept versus concept that's going on here, if you're thinking philosophically? Something has to do with observation. Something has to do with perception. A lot of it here has to do only with concept. Um, we are deliberately cutting away percept from concept when we do this kind of analysis, and we're probably fooling ourselves if we think that we're getting physics out of this just from the mathematical work. So needs more thought. Um, I could go on to talk about constraints uh, and how uh, going to the next order of constraint beyond the one that had us looking at a quadratic Hamiltonian uh, gives rise to some relationships with relativity. But this is probably a good place to stop and maybe wonder about what the models would look like if you think of them as discrete models on the one hand, and if they are discrete models, to think of discrete motions of a point moving around in space. All of this would apply to things like that. Um, there's certainly more to think about, and I'll stop here. Luke, thank you very much indeed. That was very exciting indeed. And I'm glad you stopped there because I was going to stop you anyway because I wanted to jump in. And just a minute, I'll put my. Uh, no, let me see. I, I, I get to come 